Ah, who are, Jason, who are you kidding? It's like putting lipstick on a pig. Oh, I didn't know we were doing sunglasses. <laughs> oh, there you, you tell are. me we're doing so I could have done the whole Roddy Roddy Piper. Oh, okay, we'll go get him. Now it's like I said, I don't, I don't what my traipsing all over the house just to do a physical bit. Come on. <laughs> all right. What am I, carrot top? <laughs> he's so terrifying in real life. I didn't. Oh, yeah. Now so that he's much. all veiny and buff. Yeah. Yeah. Try sharing a fucking service elevator with Carrot Top. That's the it's a nightmare. You That's shared the... a service elevator with Carrot Top? Well, that's a story we need to talk about before we talk <laughs> about anything else. And Reba McIntyre. She looks like the crypt. She looks keeper. like a buff drag queen now. Hey, Carrot Top's uh, terrifying. <laughs> well, a lot more scary than most Carpenter films. Yeah. Um, Hey, what a segue. So welcome uh, back to Director's Cut. This is the show where we not only review films, uh, but the directors themselves and pretty much their entire filmographies. This is We put a lot of work into this, uh, ladies and gentlemen. So uh, I am joined today. My name is John Dunning. I'm joined today by my co-host, Jason Alt. How's it going, everybody? Everybody. So this is a little bit different from what you guys and gals are used to. Uh, this is not a live show anymore, but this is a little bit more adding on to the aesthetics of the show, and I think it is going to be all the better for it. One thing that has not changed is that we have special guests on the show. Jason, who do you have? Mm, my special guest is a delicious Belgian quadruple from Michigan Shorts Brewery. It's called Obliviate, and uh, it's called that because you won't remember last night. <laughs> nice. What's the ABV on that? Oh man, I wonder whether it's even listed. It's probably like nine or ten percent, forty percent. Yes, <laughs> it is a malt liquor. <laughs> High it's not listed. You know, I did a lot of research, but I didn't research the ABV on my beer. Sorry about that. I'm sure, that information's available online. Why don't you do some work and go look it up? There you go. Go on Let's Untapped. See if you really care. Yeah. <laughs> uh, today I have uh, an old brewery that I used to drink a lot in Vegas, but I haven't had this one. Uh, this is Hop Valley Alpha Millennium. And it's an Imperial Double IPA, nine point two percenter. Um, and this, uh, yeah, this is going to be delicious. I, I even have a Hop Valley Stein. Um, so it's not like I'm sponsored by them or anything, but maybe I should be. You are just showing off. Kind of, yeah. I mean, it looks like uh, it kind of looks like the cover to the first film that we would be talking about in our. Oh, 12.3%. I just looked it up. Wow. Talk about showing off. 40 Imperial Beverage units. Maybe I shouldn't have asked. Now I feel like a pansy. Oh, well. No, it's fine. Dr drink your Kinder beer. It's fine. <laughs> My 9.2. So cheers, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Prost. Mm. Mm, mm, mm. Mm. Oh, man. Yeah. God, I miss Top Valley. Ooh. That is a tasty brew. Yeah, this is... Uh, yeah, man, this is great. Eugene Oregon does beer right. All right. Uh, yeah, Jason, happy... This is our our spooky episode. This is happy... Ooh, ooh, it's spooky. You know, uh, John Carpenter just goes to, to show that you, you should know the difference between horror and terror. Yeah. Uh, right? Like yeah. The difference between horror and terror is like the difference between assault and battery. Use them interchangeably, but they're not. There's a very distinct difference. You know, battery is... It, terror is like battery. Right? It's like it's in your face. It's it's brutal. Battery's getting hit, right? It's getting run over with a car or shot in the face. You know, pistol whipped. That's, that's terror. That's your, you know, your monster chewing on you. There's... Slash the mugger hitting you, but horror, it's like it's like assault, right? It's like the apprehension. And the apprehension can be worse. You know, it's uh it's what happens before and after yeah. you know, the attack. So that the he's he's made you uh he, he's the master of suspense, just like his uh his hero Alfred Hitchcock. He he's the horror master. That that's uh I don't know if anyone who Kind of went in his because uh, he invented the slasher genre basically. So the people that made the movies after him, I don't know if they got the memo that they're making horror movies and not terror movies. <laughs> Some of them, but it, it seems like he um, he basically influenced everybody. 
Yeah, you don't get the the moniker of master of horror for no reason. Um, and Salt and Battery, there's and there's plenty of that in his films. There, I, I think that the the apprehension was extremely strong. Um, if you really think about it, and this is one thing that really stood out to me in uh, as an ongoing theme for a horror director, you think of you know Clive Barker and Wes Craven. You get buckets of, of blood and guts, and I. As far as a horror filmmaker goes, Carpenter is the most restrained w w as far as that goes. Uh, you know, w the thing and some of the, the later works with, you know, notwithstanding. But he, you don't go to a Carpenter film just to see the blood and guts. It's, uh, that's, that's not what's horrifying. That may be terrifying, but he's trying to horrify you. Um, you know, it's a, it's not quite seeing the monster. It's seeing them react to seeing the monster. Yeah. That's that's what Hitchcock did well. That's why I kind of try to make the case sometimes that M. Night Shyamalan knows what he's doing. What? <laughs> no. Right? Because a good suspense director will show a thing happening for a split second. Then you see the person react to it. And you see, oh, he's shitting himself. Maybe I should shit myself. And then they show it again, you know? Yeah. So, Unfo unfortunately, I think he, that's what he got away from later on, though, because uh, I think after and maybe it's just the sign of the times or, or, you know, that kind of thing worked and was very effective early on in his career in the in the 70s and the 80s and even, you know, half of the 90s. But then kind of when he started getting up there in age, you just saw it was just jump scare galore. And that's when I was just I don't know. After a while, I started getting a little annoyed. A crunch. Crunch. Yeah. You know, he used to. I don't know. He used them sparingly. It's just, it. he's John Carpenter's kind of like Kevin Smith. The more money you give him, the worse his movie is. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, yeah. Absolutely. Like dark start was his clerks. It's like, I made this for $12,000. And it's a mess. Yeah. Give me 60 million. I will make a steaming piece of shit. <laughs> and I'll make the ward for 60 million. That was his purpose. cop out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, <laughs> <Come on>. out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so true too. God. Uh, but yeah, I, I mean, he, m most artists like him, uh, that aren't appreciated in their own time. You don't get to see it like cataloged as well as we got to see it with John Carpenter, because he was just coming out with literally not just the best horror films, but some of the best films ever made. You think of Halloween and the film uh, and the thing and how much that trailblaze everything and how critically pined everything was, but he's still they around. Were, they were cult movies. Yeah. The critics, the critics weren't ready for John Carpenter. You know, and everybody made redundant, schlocky slasher crap after him. So he got blamed for that. So some of his later stuff, he was painted, it was like, oh, this is the guy that does the, the ghoulies type movies. You know, when it, none of that was really his fault. He, uh, he blazed a trail and, you know, Sometimes you're uh sometimes you're a trailblazer. Uh and nobody believes you in your own time and you you're like uh jo the guy who wrote uh Confederate Dun Confederacy of Dunces, you know. <laughs> luckily we appreciated John Carpenter in his lifetime and luckily he gave us more than one masterpiece. So I, I'm not as I'm not as much of a hipster to claim that I know so much about HP Lovecraft uh, when I when I don't. But it wasn't that kind of a similar thing. Like while HP Lovecraft was was writing all this stuff, like no one got it. Everyone hated it. And, and then it wasn't until after he was dead that people were just like, wow, this man's kind of a genius. I, I feel yeah. like that's kind of God exactly kids. what's <laughs> happening with John Carpenter. But he's still alive to to. I mean, you you watch interviews of him, which I, I really kind of jumped down the rabbit hole. Uh, on this one, um, and he I almost didn't want to just because of how much watching it <laughs> made me hate Nicholas Winding Ruff. And <laughs> uh, you just got curmudgeon with this one. He is just a man that hates Hollywood. He hates yeah, everything. Yeah. Everyone's like, "Why don't you make another movie, John?" He's like, "I like pot and video games too much." <laughs> That's great. He doesn't need Hollywood. No. No. He, and he he doesn't. I don't know, man. If he were making really good stuff that just like, oh, you didn't get it. You know, it did poorly at the box office, but it was a good movie. Fine. But he wasn't. He was making fucking Ghosts of Mars. So like. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
it was almost like he was force feeding. He's just like, this is what you guys want now. Fine. Here, take it. And yeah. Yeah. Like he's just almost parodying. <laughs> what, oh, this is what you want, idiot. Yep. And uh, everyone's like, no, th this isn't good either. He's like, well, fuck it. I don't care. Uh, he will never make so and, and watch like in 20 years, we're going to be talking about it. Wearing the pens being like ghost of Mars was brilliant. Like it was amazing. I, I get it now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jason Statham was a vision, you know, just like, no, no, he, yeah, I, I think he, he begrudges, begrudgingly made studio films because at that time studios were just like, okay, what else can we do to kind of squeeze blood out of this rock? Well, but why did, why would he go back to studio films? Cause they interfered with big trouble so much that he said, fuck it. And he made two great films in the, in the years back to back, just to, just to be like, nah, I don't need your interference. And he didn't have the budget that he did for Big Trouble, but he didn't have the interference. And unshackled John Carpenter makes masterpieces. Well, you know? but but he won I mean, he did it for I think the same reason he did Christine, which Christine wound up being, and we'll talk about Christine in a little bit, but wound up being in, in my opinion one of his best films but he did it for a paycheck he fucking hated stephen king he hated the book even i love the jabs that he, he took at him later on uh in another movie uh but he he just basically said i didn't like it but i just did it for a check he's so like honest and almost off-putting in that way where he, even though his views don't line up with someone like a james woods he could get along with that type of person because he's just petulant. Like he, he thrives on just being <laughs> petulant. They're both just such dicks. It's like, oh, I can get along with James Woods kind of, yeah, yeah. You know what? I hate Hollywood. James Woods like, yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> I hate everybody. $25 million. Are... <laughs> oh God. Yeah. But uh, I mean, his first film and I, this is one that I never even knew existed and this was one of his uh i think it was his his uh student piece at usc yeah, yeah. turned it into a feature length film dark star is just incredible yeah um and you know what they didn't have he didn't have much money so the fact that he didn't have much money for effects meant he accidentally like uh, i compare this to jaws being terrifying because the mechanical shark didn't work <laughs> like if can you imagine if they got the mechanical shark at Jaws to work and the thing was jumping out of the fucking water and like the shark got twenty five minutes of screen time? Can you imagine how dumb that would have been? Yeah, as much. If you go back now and if you like with our technical special effects now and you look at a dumb mechanical shark back in the seventies, it would look like shit. But Jaws holds up so well because you never see you see the shark's open mouth about to bite a dude, and that's like it, right? Like. He didn't have the money for the mechanical shark, so he just made better movies. It was like George Lucas not having the money to to make Attack of the Clones. So he's <laughs> like, yeah, what, what can I make cheap? Ah, how about A New Hope? Right. <laughs> so you give Carpenter more money, and I think it was just because he was later in his career and he was jaded. But like student film, my God, you know, this was a uh, this was THX 1138 good. You know, <laughs> we were talking about Lucas. my God, like to imagine that, that he made a movie this good, this early is it, incredible. And he, what he dropped out of, he didn't even finish school. Right. Yeah. The, the, the writing in this, and I will, that that's one of the things that I have to consistently give Carpenter kind of crap for is the, like the dialogue is not always the strongest it, uh, there was definitely a falling off point, but I mean, the the writing in in Dark Star is just so crisp, so intelligent, so highbrow. And even though your your monster, so to speak, is literally a spray painted beach ball that looks like a fucking watermelon, um, yeah. It, but it it fit like everything fit. I never like while while watching that film, I never felt like it was silly or outdated. Like it, it was just. It was just guys, you know, sitting in isolation in a room with porn on their wall, smoking cigarettes. And then they're like, yeah, go feed the alien. And everything felt so like, yeah, of course this would happen. There's going to be a guy that like lives up in the, in the, in the observation deck that just like, you know, that's losing his mind because he's just looking at, you know, the galaxies passing by. And uh, as far as the writing goes, like uh, making a bomb that, 
talk that you could like communicate with back and forth and theorize with it was just like this was probably his best written film. I mean, maybe. Did Kevin Smith ever improve on Clerks? <laughs> you, you get that uh, one idea that you get that one idea that you think of when you're 14 and it's in your head for 10 years. Sure. Just getting better. You know, and then then you finally get 60 grand to, to make it. And uh, I don't know, man. I liked I liked this movie a lot for for his first effort. Yeah. Fantastic. Thinking about the effects, too, at that time, like with the explosion and just I mean, everything was like painted models and everything. But uh, w when they when they do the bomb ignition and I mean, it was the effects were as good as, like you said, a new hope. I mean, I, and I think you you nailed something is. Is John Carpenter the horror genre's version of uh, George Lucas? I mean, I think there's really something to that. I mean, maybe he didn't have the good idea. Like, George Lucas wasn't a genius because he made Star Wars. He was a genius because he has to be paid in merchandising dollars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, yeah, he, he like you said, he made a new hope because he had to be restrained. And then when he finally did have the money to make the prequels, it's just people talking in green screens. Um, it, and Carpenter isn't as bad, but he went into a lot of other weird directions, but yeah. But if Carpenter hadn't made it as a director, we would still know his name because he would have been the, one of the premier 1970s and eighties movie soundtrack composers. Yeah, that's, that's something absolutely we need to touch on. Um, did he, I don't even remember, did he make the soundtrack for dark? Star? I assume he did. I could look that up. I mean, he would have had to, right? He didn't have the money. Right, yeah. Who else was going to do it? That's a good point. Um, let's see. Yeah. Uh, it's just crazy. And he did the voice of Talby. Um, yeah. He nice. likes he likes to do that to put himself uh, in cameo <laughs> spots in his movies. And a lot of times it's just his voice, which is fine. Yeah. You know? Or it's like the back of him had a pay phone or something like that. The I think my favorite uh, scene from Dark Star was the elevator scene because it was a perfect marriage of comedy and um, suspense. You know, th there's a little bit of like, oh, shit, is he going to fall? Is he going to get there in time? Is he going to get squished? Because at any time in, in that film, you were either laughing at the absurdity, but not laughing at it. You were just kind of getting the joke or you were kind of like, OK, at any moment, this cute little, you know, beach ball is just going to like rip this dude's face off. Um, and it was kind of unceremoniously. I mean, spoiler alert, but this movie is like older than dirt, you know, unceremoniously, like most of the cast just kind of dies off screen. So he likes to do kind of his best movies were sort of like bottle movies. If that makes sense, like one small confined area that everyone's sort of like, he contrives a way for them not to be able to leave really. You know, so it's like he did that for budgetary reasons. So he didn't have all these big elaborate sets. It was mostly contained. But like once he figured that out, like that was a good formula mm -hmm. because, you know, it, it's it, it's more horrifying. It's like there's a monster locked in here with us. Claustrophobic for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that that segues perfectly into the next film. And, and for someone called the Horror Master, his first two films not being horror at all he was actually influenced more by like space invading movies and uh he just wanted to make westerns he didn't even care about the horror genre he just wanted to make westerns but he just couldn't get funding for that kind of, those kind of projects so he started making horror because it was cheap and studios would pay more because even back then back in the 70s he knew they would turn a profit yeah so he tried to this was like a black exploitation rio bravo almost right like <laughs> yeah if you think about uh, Assault on Precinct 13 was real claustrophobic and uh, yeah, shoestring budget. Great cast of relative unknowns at the time and just, you know, launched. This uh, might be my best score. Or this might be one of my favorite scores. Dun, 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 It's just like, like who, a... was, who, who had even acted before? Like Tony Burton? Like anybody else even really... Uh, uh no yeah I, it was all relatively unknowns because i like you said it, it had a like a zero budget um but b before we 
dive really. I mean, Martin it. Martin West, I think, probably, but like he did this movie for cheap. Everybody did. What What would you letter grade Dark Star real quick? Let, let's Let's add that to the mix of what a, we do here. A plus, A minus. Fuck yeah, uh, yeah. I would say A minus. Yeah, I think he hit it. But, out but I'm I'm w- I'm grading on a curve. I'm waiting it because like it was his first movie. But you say, know, I'm not say gonna be like, oh, the alien looked the alien looked lame. Ugh, <laughs> What what if he did it in the eighties instead, and he had a little bit more budget, and alien looked. He might have fucked it up. He exactly. he actually might have he might have ruined it. He might yeah. not. Have, he yeah. might have done like a an eighty CGI alien that looks like the Dire Straits "Money for Nothing" video. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you never know. <laughs> yeah, a my yeah. I, I think I, I'll have to settle with you on a minus. So yeah, let's go to Sulfur Precinct Thirteen. What a fucking brutal movie this was! Oh my god. It's almost. It, it it was almost a formulaic, nineteen seventies rumble movie, mm-hmm. but there was a Carpenterian sort of tinge to it he, because he did a better job of establishing how remote this police station was. He did a better job of setting the tone with the you know the the dark tinge to everything. He did a good job of establishing apprehension with the music so it like he sort of tried to make like a formulaic movie but he just accidentally did too good a job and at the time everyone was sort of like this is just sort of whatever it's just another but i think once people really started to watch it it took on like cult status because there was just something better about this movie it yeah. just it, it wasn't a you know it wasn't like every other you know, kind of movie of its ilk. And I think that it was dismissed as that by critics and nobody really expected it to be that good. Cause this was a relatively unknown director, you know, making his first real movie. Um, he had like no money and it just, it came out at a time where people were making a lot of schlocky movies. You know, the Italians were doing cheap, shitty horror movies in the seventies. Like there was just uh, a lot going on. So, I think this is one of those movies where everyone realized later how once you saw his later films, you're like, okay, in the context of his later stuff, what he was doing was good on purpose, actually. When it just sort of got lost in the shuffle because it just came out amidst a bunch of other bullshit. This movie is a perfect tension ratchet the whole time. It's just always ramping up into into the next scene. Uh, And it almost plays out like a play. Uh, which, which it basically could be like, I, I'm surprised that there aren't, you know, like assault and precinct 13 plays out there. Cause you could, you could very well do it. I, the, the difference between this and the, and the kind of seventies, you know, romp, like you said, uh, is I think that they took, they took all humanity away from the gang members. The gang members might as well have been zombies or, or yeah. zombie. Exactly. Exactly. They were just, they weren't human. They were inevitability. They had zero emotion, um, and it didn't matter. It was almost like the thing where they didn't matter what ethnicity they were. You didn't have any backstory about them. They were just there to take over and to kill mindlessly, almost like a Michael Myers. And that's what I think maybe disconnected, uh, disconnected some critics to this because you know, there was no characterization, but I mean, that's one of the the things that I love the most about this film. But I mean, that was, that was, if you look at this as Rio Bravo, you know, John Wayne, Dean Martin holding off the, the gang members trying to spring their buddy, you know, it's it's in a prison. It's basically, you know, the same movie almost Yeah, just skinned for the seventies, right? Like 15 years later, here's how I would have, made Rio Bravo now. So like he couldn't make a Western, but he kind of did. So like there wasn't really a need to develop the gang members because they were just existential horror, right? They were just the inevitability of no help coming and overwhelming numbers. There was zero dialogue from them, right? I don't remember them saying a thing. They yelled some shit. Did they? I I just remember them like sending messages like the, with, with the whole blood jar and you know, they, they were uh, which that one guy, one of the other prisoners, um, he kind of explained what that was, but I, yeah, I don't remember them saying anything. And I don't think, I don't think they had any lines. I think you're right. That's nuts, man. Um, and to have it work as, as much as it did, I was not expecting 
to enjoy this film as much as I did. And it turned out to be one of my favorites as well. I was just like, just the, the tension I was bought in. I was at the edge of my seat for, for a movie that came out in the 1970s uh, with a zero budget. And yeah, it, the score was perfect. It was so stripped down and uh, like you said, just kind of move the story uh, along. The cast was fantastic. And this was another, this was the first time that he, really dipped his toe into another ongoing Carpenter theme, and that's antagonist as protagonist. And he would do that all the way up until uh, the ward, where your protagonist is just an asshole. Not not the cop. Like, the main cop in this, yeah, he's your good guy. He's your POV character. You know, he's just kind of trying to hold shit together. But everyone else is a complete asshole. Yeah. And that's, uh, you know... He still know who to root for. It's like he makes you root for shitty people. I like <laughs> yeah, I give this like a B, B minus. I really enjoyed this. Yeah, uh, man, I, I'm gonna have to go back with an A minus. I, I liked it. Wow, for different reasons, at least just as much as Dark Star. Um, Dark Star was was fantastic, but this just had this has everything, man. Like, and don't watch the don't watch the remake. The remake to this is is garbage. I I messed up. <laughs> Did you watch? It? I saw I saw it when it came out. Ooh. Well, you didn't. It know. was like uh, it was like fifteen. Yeah, it was on Cinemax. I was like, dude, cool. <laughs> it would be on Cinemax. This feels like a very Cinemaxy. I liked it. Saw it on Precinct Thirteen. I saw that. <laughs> I saw like the the this one and the remake within like six months of each other. It, Ethan Hawke, right? I couldn't tell you. <laughs> Probably. Yeah, sure. It's a piece of shit. What do you want from me? Ethan yeah. Hawks in a lot of bad movies. Um, this next one's not a bad movie. Oh, though. we could skip it, though, right? Well, what are we going to say about Halloween that hasn't already been said, right? <laughs> it launched the slasher genre. It launched about six shitty sequels and two good ones. Like, did you see Halloween 2018? I, I have not yet, unfortunately. I liked it. I heard and it was I don't, pretty good. I don't typically go for slasher shit. And it was like Danny McBride wrote it. I didn't know what to think. Cause you hear Rob zombies doing a Halloween movie and you're like, Oh, fucking pass. <laughs> I saw the Rob zombie Halloween. It was terrible. Oh. So I didn't know what to think when I heard Danny Boyle or Danny Boyle, Danny McBride was like EP and co-writer on it. But like, it just, it was the perfect Halloween movie. He should just, just do was, other things yeah. other than his Danny McBride stuff. Right. I, like I don't know. He could I'm fine. Right? I like these bounded down. I like his I don't know, man. I really liked him in uh Pineapple Express. Yeah. So, I don't know. He can do whatever he wants, right? Yeah, I guess. He just he just I don't know. He just looks like such a schmuck, so I guess that's like stuck in my head that he should be yeah, a schmuck. Yeah, you just underestimate you think he's <laughs> You think he's the foot fist way guy in real life? Yeah, exactly. I'm like, God, he's like, what? Just because I talk like this, I can't write a good movie? Fuck you, man. Yeah. So like Larry the Cable Guy, fuck off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but if Larry the Cable Guy were a point laureate or something, you're like, what? <laughs> he's like, you know, that's a character, right? My name's Dan Whitney, and I was a shitty 80s relationship comic with a mullet wearing khakis. <laughs> dragging my butt on stage doing an impression of a dog with worms and then he's found that layer the cable guy thing that stuck he's like well i i can rip the sleeves off a shirt let's do this let's be a billionaire i guess i'm gonna do that hey man <laughs> i'd buy that for a dollar oh jesus but hey halloween uh the halloween 2018 go see it if you haven't i i really liked it this, this movie uh, looked like the only Halloween sequel, because it is a Halloween sequel. They threw out the rest of it that, that John Carpenter actually cared about. Like, he, the rest of him, just like, he's just like, I don't I don't give a fuck. Like, like one of my, my favorite interviews uh, with him, where it was uh, Rob Zombie is yeah. talking, and he's just like, yeah, I called John Carpenter, and I'm like, hey, hey, John, uh, I'm going to go make a, a Halloween movie. And he's like, yeah, so? Good, great. Give me a paycheck. Like, yeah, uh, I don't give a shit. <laughs> yeah, uh, but it looked like he actually cared a little bit more. Like he was doing pressers with uh, with Blum, with uh, what's his face Blum or whatever. Um, so he, he did care. But talking about the original, you know, going back to the original, well, he was he, he got credit on it, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He did. So like he 
he actually wanted to put out a good one, I guess. I don't know how much work he did, but I, I, you get an EP credit probably just by supporting it, right? Well, he was a producer on the rest on all of the other ones, but he was never an EP on. So I think he had to do, he had to put in a little bit more effort for this one. I mean, I don't. Maybe <laughs> I, don't know what, I don't know what an EP does, right? As Producer much as uh, writes checks and an EP does press, I don't know. As much as a seventy-year-old, you know, elderly man can do, I guess. Who just uh, wants to play Fortnite and smoke pot? <laughs> <laughs> He's just doing the floss like constantly in his house. Oh, <laughs> what an image! Yeah, John Carpenter's the man. He uh, and Halloween. If he hadn't, this could have been a piece of shit real easily, right? Like, if you'd have given this script to another director, and, and he wrote the screenplay with uh, with Debbie Hill, but I mean, like, if you'd given this screenplay to, to somebody else, they probably would have made a pretty shitty movie because they wouldn't have nailed the tone. And the tone is what made Halloween so terrifying. The fact that, like, you're in a neighborhood, but so what? Where are you going to go? Yeah. The guy won't stop. You can't kill him. You can't stop him. You don't, he's not saying shit. You don't know why he's trying to kill everybody. You just, he doesn't know, know why. why he just does. Yep. He's, he's, the, he's the shark in Jaws. Yeah. Yeah. He's the shark in Jaws and you can show him on screen, but and he looks like Shatner, which is terrifying. He is Shatner. <laughs> That's a yeah, Shatner, Shatner mask. face, which is it's weird. This is the best acting Shatner's face has ever. <laughs> I'm going to have to stab you now. <laughs> it's actual Shatner's face. They, you know, that was like the 40th facelift and he just donated it to, uh, <laughs> John I don't know. He get facelifts. He gets two pays. Yeah. Sorry, Bill. Um, oh, what, what, what's he going to do? I know he's, he's to your podcast. podcast. Get fucked. <laughs> <laughs> I like how the three finalists for the mass were Shatner Leonard Nimoy and some like, uh, oh man, it was some clown. It was like a sad face clown. It was the same. This is a fun little piece of trivia. The same sad face clown that they used in Dark Knight Rises um, when when the Joker in the beginning is doing the bank heist, uh, bank heist scene. He's yeah. wearing that that uh, that mask. That was actually going to be the Michael Myers mask, but I am so happy they went with the the Will Shatner mask because it's terrifying. And you don't know why it's it's so wooden and expressionless. I mean, what else do we need to say so about it? wooden? <laughs> what do we need to say about Halloween other than how much we liked it? Well, I mean, he he pulled out some shit out of his ass, man. Like this was the one where yeah, he yeah, had yeah. 60, 65000 dollars uh, $65, budget. He sat down, uh, or was it six hundred? Six hundred thousand? Six hundred thousand. Three hundred? Three hundred grand estimated. Damn oh, it. that yeah, yeah. I'm gonna look. But, I mean, but who knows? Like that's just an estimate. And well, it made seventy million worldwide. Well, this was this was it because it, it, you know if you look it up, it does say three hundred thousand dollar budget, but then it also says three twenty five, and the twenty five was to hire Donald Pleasance. Uh, Donald Pleasance was the only real actor at the time. You know, of course, you know Jamie Lee Curtis and everything, but yeah. no, no one. Well, she I was mean, nineteen years old. Uh, yeah. No, and, and Pleasance gave the movie a little credibility. That was worth it. And then he was hooked. He got the carpenter bug, and he couldn't get rid of Pleasance. <laughs> but, I mean, when someone gets it, and they're easy to direct, I just feel kind of like, do you want to take a chance on someone, or do you like, when you write, and Carpenter wrote a lot of this shit, so like, why wouldn't you have a, a Donald Pleasance type in mind? Yeah. Uh, this is also the first film that Dean Cundy, the you know his his kind of go to cinematographer, came in. Dean Cundy came from a lot of those like uh, like teenage exploitation films from the seventies, um, and I mean, wow, what a marriage! He would use Dean Cundy all the way up until you know later on in his career, but uh, it was it was a perfect marriage of things. Um, the the cinematography on this was great because it had to be great. They couldn't they couldn't afford reshoots or extra time so they just but it didn't it time. didn't have to be great cuz they shot the opening scene last when everyone was exhausted. The tracking shot around the, the house. And they had the guy go through 
the house and they were taking shit out of his way and just like it was a really difficult shot and they did it last when like everyone just wanted to rap so it didn't have to be great i mean that another director would have half-assed it maybe for and sure he was like, we have to nail this because it he understands that the setting and the tone make the movie so I I think when you when you establish the setting perfectly, and that's it's easier to do that with one or two locations, which is why he tends to do that. It, it's not always for budgetary reasons because I think once you establish that one place is remote, it's like all right, we're in Antarctica. Good luck. Like once you do all that work to to talk about why this is a place and you're all alone and it, it's terrifying, why would you move? It's effective. Look at the first Alien. Right. It's it's very claustrophobic. It's very it's all happens on one area. And if you just spend all your time and effort in one single place, isolated place, then you have all the time in the world to make that place a character. Yeah. So the places are a character in this film because of the, the lighting and the, the sound. And. Yeah, yeah. I, I just love that they like literally no budget to where. They would, you know, because I, I think I, I forgot where exactly they shot it, but they would they would it wasn't fall. It, they would throw leaves on the ground that they hand painted. And then after each scene, including like Jamie Lee Curtis and all the other, you know, girls and guys on the set would have to like gather those painted leaves up because they only had two trash bags full. It's like that's how Gorilla this was shot. And it's just all the better for it because everyone gave a shit. Everyone had a role. They weren't just actors and actresses. I mean, yeah. Jamie Lee Curtis was doing makeup, you know, on, on half these people with no training or anything. It's just like everyone cared. And that's why it was just a perfect film. That's kind of why I think that the money to, I don't know. If you don't have to worry about anything, then you maybe don't. Yeah. Well, other people can. You pay people, other people, to worry about it, and then they're not going to worry about it. Another, as much. It's another job at the another day at the movie factory. Yeah, it's, it's punch in, do your makeup, punch out. Yep. And Absolutely. maybe that's maybe that's what he tapped into the fact that you know here we are shitting on all of Hollywood, <laughs> <laughs> never having had anything to do with it. But it's just sort of like that. I think he kind of grew disillusioned with Hollywood as a sort of a, a grinder where dreams go in and meat product comes out. If anyone has right to shit on Hollywood, it's John Carpenter though. So I think, I, I think he realizes he had more fun when everyone gave a shit. And when it's just like, here's $60 million, do something with Matthew Baldwin. And he's like, fine. <laughs> James, James Woods is only going to come on your movie. If you shoot every scene twice, one with him improvising and one with your, script Ugh. and then you never okay. use the improv because fuck james woods yes exactly <laughs> and i think it was like on big trouble when the studio really started to interfere and he just like okay the money's nice but it's not worth it so i i think back when he gave a, a real shit he was making good movies yep and, and before he was disillusioned too because this was yeah th this was his first kind of knock to his ego because i think this was the opposite of the reception on Assault. Assault did get, you know, it didn't make a ton of money, but there was some some reputable people at the time that were just like, oh, you did make a pretty good film, so we want you to do this. Where Halloween, he's just like, no, I put my blood, sweat, and tears, everyone did, and then everyone shit on it until Roger Ebert kind of dug it out from the ashes. I mean, it almost did its entire theatrical run, because remember, at the time... Theaters, it's not like it was today where, where everywhere opened at the same time where, you know, it's like Spider-Man 18 comes out and everyone on the same day in every single city, small or large, could go out and see it. Halloween, it, you know, movies back then when Halloween came out, it went from city to city to city to city because the actual film reel would have to travel. So, I mean, it was like a, it was like touring like a band and he just got torn apart during the entire run until Roger Ebert finally kind of resurrected it. And that's when he just like, you know, he kind of got his confidence back, but, but still he was just like, at, you know, everyone hated him and everyone wrote it off until Ebert kind of dug it out from the ashes. Yeah. 
And it, it's good because, I mean, it was it was the movie everyone imitated after that, right? Like yeah. everyone was making slashers. I mean, you got Friday the Thirteenth, but you also got Sleepaway Camp, so you, you know you had to <laughs> take the good with the bad. Yeah. Uh, um, so, I, do we just give this an A plus? I mean. Well, I wasn't gonna go that far. I was gonna say B plus, maybe. It's not perfect, but it was it was great. What's your ish? What's your, uh, what's your you can't give everything an A, man. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I would maybe, say probably, probably any minus B plus. I mean, it wasn't a worse movie than Dark Star by any means. No. Uh, I just say I, you know, for what it is, how iconic it was, I think this was. An A, a solid A. Uh, maybe. I mean, uh, yeah, sure, but I, I just, I, I don't, I, I don't want to romanticize it too much, just because of how important it was. That's fair. Still giving it an A. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, and then he I followed will be bullied, it up with man. The... I'm changing my end to a B minus. No. <laughs> I'm going the other way. Fuck Halloween. Uh, yeah. And then let's go to his follow up, The Fog. Jason, what's the fog about? Huh, who knows, man? It's about a fog. <laughs> yeah. It's about the fog. Uh, it's about as scary as you imagine something called the fog is. Like, this was a 60s movie made in 1980. Like, why? I don't know. I thought this was kind of a piece of shit. This was the worst remake of The Blob I've ever seen. And they remade this movie. And the remake was somehow worse. And then they remade it and called it The Mist, and it was good. Yeah, and he probably didn't appreciate Stephen King doing that. <laughs> right. That was probably Stephen King's jab back, you know? <laughs> He's like, listen. We're the ghosts of uh, a boat that wrecked. How dare you light a campfire? Ooh, we're the mist <laughs> monsters. It's a fucking Scooby-Doo episode. I don't uh, know, man. This this didn't unsettle me. I think, I, I think he was trying too hard not to make Halloween. I am so happy that we're on the same boat with the ah, on the same boat. With ah, this one. Ooh, don't want to be on the boat. What about our boat racks? Ooh, how to be <laughs> mist monsters? <laughs> this movie even sucked. Adrian Barbeau's big titties couldn't save this movie. Was that his wife? Though his wife, right at the time? Yeah, I think so. The new the the sexy uh, radio caster, right? Is that Adrian Barbeau? Stevie Wayne. <laughs> Her name yeah. is Stevie Wayne. This movie is the worst uh, until later on. And then he made a lot worse. And he made, he made way worse. Yeah. But at the, t I mean, it, it made 20 times its budget back. Like people wanted Halloween and they went to see it, but it just, it wasn't, he didn't know why Halloween was good. I think that's, that's my theory. <laughs> that's yeah, that's fair. Because the very, Next year, he made a great fucking movie. Well, did, do you think this? Do you think the fog was just him, like literally smelling his own farts a little bit? Where he's just like, I, oh. I don't, I could, yeah, I can do what I want. I'm gonna remake a, I'm gonna make some 60s esque horror movie. Like, it is a monster movie and it isn't. So it's, I don't know, man. It's just the premise is fucking stupid and it's hard to get over that. It's Pirates of the Caribbean. I mean, it's just, it literally, is. like, I was watching it, and I'm like, oh, my God, where the fuck is Jack Sparrow? Like, it's that, that bad. Uh, and maybe, you know, Pirates kind of ripped off the fog. Who knows? But either one is terrible. Uh, I got to give this one a, a solid, like, D plus, because it's still, it, there's still some interesting moments, but not enough. I feel like he learned some stuff. Sure. And I think making a piece of shit movie like this made him, you know, double down on being <laughs> John Carpenter. Yeah. I think everybody wants to say that Halloween is like the quintessential Carpenter movie. I think escape from New York. When I think of John Carpenter and it, okay. I saw big trouble in little China in 1988, you know, as a kid, four right? years old. No, it was it must have been an 89. Yeah, because I was living in South Carolina. My dad showed me this movie, parts of it. They thought I could handle. And I just thought it was crazy. <laughs> and I dressed up as Jack Burton all the time. You know, I was. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, I thought that movie was the, the shit, the parts my dad showed me. So I think the kind of 
creature feature type. Just, I think Escape from New York is is quintessential Carpenter. He should have made more movies like this. You know, it just the the soundtrack was perfect. Like the the premise was so weird and dumb. It was like a weird pseudo futuristic. Just I don't know. Just like I like the tone of this movie. Yeah, you know, I like. I just it's dumb. It is dumb, but in a great way. But in like it, it didn't take itself too seriously. You he, he can't take himself too seriously. He just makes I don't know. I, like I feel his like this one of- did uh, where where Escape from L.A. was just a complete parody. This I did think tried to take itself seriously, um, and I and I just loved the uh, he he wasn't doing John Wayne. Who was he doing? And uh, Kurt Russell was always doing a character or caricature in in Carpenter films, except in the thing. But uh, yeah, he was just doing the uh, di- like a Dirty Harry in in Escape from New York. Um, yeah, it's good, but it's not one of my favorites for some reason. It, it's just not as cohesive. Like Donald Pleasance is back. Like it, it has a lot of things to really like about it. Um, but it, it's just, I don't know something about it. I just, it just kind of turned me off a little bit, but it, it's probably just a me problem. It, it's not a bad movie by any means. Um, it's uh, it's not it's not a great movie either, but right. it just I liked it. Sure, it does, does it make sense when a movie's not great, but you like what it was going for? Yeah, yeah. I like I like the ethos of, of this movie. Henry Dean I like Stanton it's... was good. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Ernie fucking Borgnine was in this movie. Come on, man. That's that's true. And maybe maybe that was it. That was so shocking that there were so many like movie stars in it, like Isaac Hayes. Uh, is it is in it because it got it was his first big budget movie. He got six uh-huh. million to make this. I just I, I don't I kind of I like post apocalyptic John Carpenter, and now all we get is like gunship music videos. We don't get good movies. <laughs> another another fantastic score though, and, and it was such a. This was also you know Halloween gets a lot of credit for being a trailblazer in its genre, but this you know with the whole uh, you know bombs in the neck, which they would you know rip off later in Suicide Squad and so many other things. Uh, you know you think th- there's so many like twisted metal type of movies like this, like your your death races and all and your Hunger Games and all this bullshit where you gotta you know kill your your neighbor to to survive and all this stuff. Where this was really the first one of its time, so. You know, you got to give it all the praise for for being. Are you a bad enough dude to rescue the president? Yeah, solid B for me. I liked Escape from New York. It wasn't I, I, great. I, I'm not going to give it an A because I because I like it so much. But sure, if he made t- ten movies like this, I'd be super happy. I love the mat mat paintings in this film. The, like the setting was great. I, I'm yeah. talking myself into a higher number. I think because this I think this came out before Mad Max or at least around the same time. So. Yeah, the the like the early '80s, late '70s really liked that post-apocalyptic thing, um, and the, and the, that's this is when they were doing it right. Uh, probably a B minus. I'm gonna give this one a B minus. That's that's fair. Yeah, let's uh, talk about probably our favorite movie on this list. I mean, this was just yeah. Solid A for me. This is just great. And it's scary as fuck that they found a perfectly square piece of ice in Antarctica. What's that all about? (laughs) Right? Oh, man. This is in there. This is totally going back to your point about the George Lucas comparison where they try to do the, the remake, the prequel to the thing. And it's not even the, oh, the Jesus. it's not even the filmmaker's fault though. Like they tried and they like the studio did all the practical effects and it just looked great. And then a bunch of people, you know, fat guy, fat white guys in a in a boardroom smoking cigars, just like, yeah, you know what's better? We should do the CGI. And it just looked horrible. Um, and it was just a travesty because the 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 story and the writing, or you know, the the plot for the sequel to the thing was was pretty good but that just goes to show you if you give something money then god it just ruins it i mean this this showed more of the monster than i would have liked but like i think that was i don't know 
it, it, this this movie was a little bit Cronenbergian in showing more of the monsters, and he would do more of that later the more money he got. And like that's not always bad, you know. Sometimes if you got a cool mechanical shark, you should show it to people. And y you know the when people stopped using practical effects, I I don't know. There's like a weird uncanny valley thing where a monster isn't scary if it looks too good. Almost, but, you know. But it was still so tactile. I mean, where else are you gonna see a, a a husky's face like split open like a starfish, you know, and, and then have the little dog skull pop out? Like these are such meticulous little details and blink and you're gonna miss it. But it's so full of just art. Like every practical effect in this, it, it, you say you know you see the monster too much, but they changed the monster up so much that it was so yeah. gorgeous to look at. Now, this movie was great. We don't need to talk about it too much other than it seems like he learned a few important lessons, which is use Keith David in movies. Oh, I know it's pretty, baby. But I didn't take it out for air. Just creep people out. You know, people like being creeped out as much as they like being scared. So there are a little bit more jump scares in this movie than I would have liked, but there was so much tension. But there was so earned, though. Like, like yeah. the, the scene where he's doing the the petri dish. You, I mean, if, if any jump scare scene ever in the history of horror was earned, it was that one. And th this is where he was the most heavy handed with his little wink nod. He likes to name characters after people from other things. Sure. So maybe you subconsciously pick on the is like, oh, that's the guy from Rear Window. He did that <laughs> a lot in this one. This was his first installment into you know what we're we're gonna talk about as the uh, what the apocalypse series, some unofficial series that he did, and, and this was number one. Even though the thing was you know this is the best remake of all time because the thing is not uh, an original Carpenter piece, but uh, you know it would go on to have its sequels, I guess you could say, in uh, with the Prince of Darkness and uh, in the Mouth of Madness. But yeah. best best Kurt Russell ever. I mean. My favorite scene of all time, probably top 10 in any movie at all, is Kurt Russell doing the the voice recording where he's just so broken down and he's just like, oh, we're just so, you know, we don't know who who is what. I'm just so tired. Like it, the way he delivered those lines were just like my that's that has to be one of my favorite scenes in, in movie history. I really like I mean, the thing, Jason. It's not hard too much on the thing. Yeah. I mean, it is what it is. A fucking plus. Every everybody, yeah, everybody knows the thing, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> all right, all right. Let's go to Christine. What do you think about? Didn't Christine? like it. Didn't like didn't Christine. Like nah, didn't like it. Why? I, I like the book better. Carpenter hated the book. Yeah, I got that. I got that sense because later on he was like, "I hated the book." Yeah. Uh, this this is his, uh, th you know, he got so much shit for the thing. He was just like, uh, I, I just, I made Christine for a paycheck. I didn't like the book, you know, as we stated before. Uh, he didn't even like Stephen King. And, and I guess after he made the film, Stephen King watched it, really liked it. And then like literally like a month later, he freaked out and, and slammed it publicly. And Carpenter said it was because that was King's coke phase. So, <laughs> well, it was. Right, he's not wrong. <laughs> no. I just I don't know. The book was scary. And when you saw it, you're like, oh, it's just a stupid fucking car, isn't it? And like when the car would like fix itself, I was like, God, this looks so stupid. I just hated how this movie looked. It just didn't when he adapts stuff, it just doesn't I don't know, man. I oh. just uh, I don't like his I don't really like any of his adaptations. I will totally. Well, the thing's an adaptation. Yeah, but I just didn't. It didn't feel like. I don't know. I, I will totally disagree with you on Christine because everything again, everything was practical. You don't see films doing but it this looked, kind of it thing. Looked stupid. Like oh. when you when it's, you know a car is supposed to look like a car. It looks like a car. Like if it's some freaky monster dripping shit and it like looks like an inside out human that's freaky a car that like pulls dents out and I'm like yeah this is fucking lame 
<laughs> and the book was scary. So like, it was sort of like, that's why people like Lovecraft because Lovecraft is like, oh, the monster is too complex to even describe and right. anyone who gazes upon it loses their mind. You're like, you just don't know how to describe it. But like, if you'd made the Call of Cthulhu or some shit into a movie and you just showed it, I don't know, like uh, seeing it like, oh, Cthulhu, it's like it's like a monster, right? And he's got tentacles in his face. Right. That's it. Like if you'd written that in the book, you'd be like, oh, I saw a monster that had a bunch of tentacles, but like instead of a mouth, instead of arms, it was really freaky. You'd be like, fuck Lovecraft. But like the fact <laughs> that he's like to gaze upon it was madness. You're like, oh, shit, I can't even fathom. When he's right. like trying to describe non Euclidean shapes, but can't, you're like, oh shit. So <laughs> I know you're supposed to show, not tell, but I don't like being shown this. I don't like it. I like Stephen King. He doesn't. I do. I don't fucking like this movie. Yeah. I don't have to. <sighs> he did a good job, kinda, but like everything he did well just made me like it less. So, so knowing how like upset he was to even make this film. Does that kind of make sense to you? Like, where he's just like, ah, I fucking hated this. So does it feel like someone made this? No, film cause didn't he didn't do, do a it? bad job. He did a fine job, but like, he, it's like he wrote a really good poem telling six year old me how Santa Claus wasn't real. <laughs> you're like, but the poem was so good. Yeah. You know, he's like you ruined a thing I like. So who cares how well it was done? I didn't think it was that well done either. I just didn't give a shit about this movie. This wow. was real forgettable for me. Man, I thought this was groundbreaking. I thought it even out like I am a huge King fan and reading the book. Yeah, I like the book, but it's just like, OK, it's a killer car. Fine. But it's a I, dumb fucking premise. By it the way. is. It really is. And it was just a manuscript that was like at that time, everyone was sucking Stephen King's dick and everyone was just like that was that family guy sketch was like my next book it's a lamp monster yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah at the time he's like uh, i got uh, a killer car and a killer dog and everyone's like okay fine we'll make these movies uh but uh, i thought he doesn't give a sh as much as he's sometimes like this was bad this was good he will sell anybody the rights to anything for a dollar have you ever seen like sell with john cusack and uh what, what's his face uh Oh god. I did not. I read the book and I was like, this is a dumb fucking premise. And I like, oh, you know what? I did see Sal. Shit, I did. And I it's was just bad. the worst. <laughs> it was so samey. It was like 28 months later. Yeah. But with phones. Oh god. It was just horrible. Well, Samuel L. Jackson. I liked the book. Fine. You know, I really enjoyed the book. So I was just seeing it and sort of like, oh, this is what it is. It's it's just exactly for whatever reason, if you sh shoot everything Stephen King writes down and she's like, okay, this is how he described it. And then you shoot it. And I'm like, ah, I don't care. <laughs> well, cause he's so overindulgent in how he writes. Like everything is so dense, like talking about how, you know, Randall flags jackets have buttons and shit. And you're just like, God, I just, you know, get on with it. But that was good. I actually liked the stand TV yeah. miniseries. I even liked the Langoliers. So the fact that I like the Langoliers more than this should piss you off. But it it's really true. pisses me off. <laughs> that makes me question. Sorry, this is my raising Arizona. So yeah, this is uh, questioning uh, uh, you know the future of this podcast. Basically, no. <laughs> C minus is Chris for Christine. Oh, Jesus. C is, C is for Christine. That's good enough for me. This is so not correct, ladies and gentlemen. I, Christine was. I mean, they don't make movies like this anymore. They they yeah, have because they made this one. They're like, oh, oh shit, we fucked up. God. <laughs> this is how this felt. <laughs> yep. Um. No, I mean, ah, I, I don't even know how to respond. Like, they made a stupid premise scary. Like, the fact when she, when she, when the car pulls out and she's on fire and, like, slowly runs down the, the gang member and then the how she looks like, she looks like Jaws at the end. Like, she's literally Jaws driving through the garage. I don't know. Whatever. I'm Look, not man, he makes you. a lot of movies that delight me. He made a Big Trouble in Little China and a Escape from L.A. and, you know, They Live. And those made me laugh. And then he made some creepy ass movies, you know, like In the Mouth of Madness and Prince of Darkness. And they creep me out. And like, I watched Prince of Darkness at 4 a.m. the first time. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. It's like watching Event Horizon. It was 
yeah, it, it legitimately freaked me out. And I like that because like I'm so I'm a, I'm an adult. <laughs> I've paid taxes. You know how terrifying <laughs> that is? Once you've paid taxes, nothing scares you anymore. Yeah, you know? your life's over pretty much. Yeah. God. I watched a baby destroy my wife's vagina from the inside out. You think <laughs> a movie? I watched that four times. Scare me? Yeah. yeah, right? It never gets any easier. And I still... Never mind. Yeah, uh, it's like when the uh, elevator opens in The Shining and you're like, ah, but... <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Once you've seen that, a movie shouldn't affect you. And he makes movies that affect me. And you know what? Christine was not one of them. God, and neither I, was this next one. I don't know which, if it's the 9.2% the of this beer, but I am truly verklempt that you do not like Christine. But I'm going to give it a solid B my, or B plus because I liked it. B so. minus? That's pretty close to a C, dog. I said B plus. B you plus. Said B, you said B minus. I know. Because I, I, you know what? I talked to you into my, but you're so stubborn. <laughs> Oh man, what what are we on now? Oh, Starman. <laughs> what? He made a PG movie. Why did he do that? He made a PG romance, like for a paycheck. Are you gonna tell me this is bad too? Because I liked it. I look. Karen Allen's the perfect woman. Okay, so right. Scrooge. Hello. <laughs> so actually, no. Nineteen uh, eighties pre nose job. Jennifer Grey is the perfect woman, but. Karen Allen's real close. I hear it. Even Sarah Jessica Parker back then in the. Oh wizard. yeah, I, I, I'm dude. I'm sorry. Everybody like, oh, she's a horse face making fun of set. Fuck, go fuck yourself. Right. She would never even fucking open a door for you. you yeah, <laughs> she wouldn't deign to fart on you, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, the, uh, I, I I thought this film was extremely off putting um, with Jeff Bridges doing his bit. But then it grows on you like a fungus, and it works. It, it, man, talk about terrifying! Like the first ten minutes this of this and film memoirs is scary. of an invisible man. Are you like, are these Carpenter movies? Yeah, the, this would the, be like, what if this would be just as weird? If, like, what if George Romero had directed Starman or like Martin Scorsese? You know, it's like they did what they he could with the script. It doesn't feel like one of his movies, and I just whatever. I don't even want to talk about it in the context of the rest of his movies. I see. I, I, you know what this feels like? It feels like when other directors and filmmakers need like a paycheck and they go direct like intros uh, to other films or, or like we talked about music Fincher. videos. Yes. Yeah. yeah, exact. Thank you. Music videos. This felt like Carpenter directed the first 15 minutes when they did the creepy weird shit when, whatever the alien's name was like forming from a baby into naked Jeff Bridges. But then the rest of the time it felt like someone else's film for sure. Yeah, He just let his, he let his DP take over and was like, whatever. Hey, how would you like to intern on a Carpenter movie? <laughs> yeah. I'm jaded yeah. as fuck by now. I've been famous for four years. I, whatever. This was, this was Harry the Henderson's. No, no, it was not that bad. This is an enjoyable film. Harry and the Hendersons is an enjoyable film. Oh, what, fuck what, you. Are you no. what are you saying? What are you saying? It's terrible. This is PG, man. This is whatever. He just. It, it's not a Carpenter movie. I don't even want to talk about it. Right? Wow. Like, it was fine. He made a fine movie. I give it a B minus. I was going to go to C plus. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, right around the. I was just being generous because I want to move on. All right, fine. C, C felt plus. like you would bully me if I said C plus. Whatever. It was just whatever. It wasn't a Carpenter movie, really. To Don't me. Don't let me pick on you. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> what would the show be without me? It would just be you agreeing with yourself. Yeah. Um. Ooh. Let's talk about my favorite John. That's Carpenter called movie. masturbation, ladies. Shall we? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I saw this movie too young. So this was like 85, 86. I saw it in probably 89, 90. It would, it would have been 89 at the earliest. So I was, what, three? My God, I can't. What a negligent father. <laughs> uh, but uh, it's, it's fun, right? This is just... Uh, the studio fucked with this movie. Yeah. He wanted to make a better movie than this, but it was still fine. You know, I... I he didn't do his typical, oh, here's a really small setting. It's really scary. Here's a whole huge expansive thing. Um, he used every bit of the 25 million, I'm sure. Um, yeah, for sure. This, 
lost a shitload of money. It mm-hmm. lost half its budget. Um, I'm sure it's made it up on DVD. This is just it. It took a while to catch on. People didn't really get what he was going for. You saw this in the theater. You're like, what the fuck did I watch? I'm not going to recommend this. This was 86. They were making Back to the Future movies and shit. <laughs> you know, like 86. <laughs> and people wanted a $25 million movie to look a certain way. And this was fucking weird. Dudes exploded. It was all Mortal Kombat and meets Temple of Doom. It was yes! just a weird movie. But it was so good because this was the best Kurt Russell. Mm. Fuck the it, thing. This, he this was, was John Wayne. He wasn't even Kurt Russell in this film. No, he, Jack Burton's not John Wayne. Yes, he is. Come on. Listen to him and like a vocal track against John Wayne and and uh, that Jack may be, Burton. but, but <laughs> John Wayne would be like, you know what John Wayne always says? Who the hell is John Wayne? <laughs> Me. Not so fast, gentlemen. Oh. Is it too much to ask, Thunder? Kill him for me! Won't solve anything, Dave. Too many people around here been dropping like flies already, and where's that getting us, huh? Nowhere. Fast. Ah, you know what old Jack Burton always says at a time like this? Who? Jack Burton. Me. (laughs) No, he had more personality. Jack Burton is easily the best character in a Carpenter movie. Well, you're 100%... This is what I want. I want... Rowdy Roddy Piper. I don't want McCready. Right, 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 right. Well, the, he, it was Indiana Andrew Jones. York. Yeah, yeah, he was Indiana Jones. Exactly. And that's yeah. that's what I want. He was white trash, sleeveless T-shirt truck driving Indiana Jones. That's what I liked about this movie. It didn't take itself seriously at all. This movie was a fucking joke, and it was so funny. This was Melton Bradley's mousetrap. Like, remember that that game. <laughs> Yeah, but yeah. The movie. Nobody ever played that game. Like, why is there a board? All you do is you set it up, then you do the thing. Yeah, <laughs> everyone just looks at it and gets entertained. That's what this movie was, in a good way and a bad way, though. Like, I don't know. I, I like you saw this at a tender young age, and I was just floored. I'm like, this is the craziest thing. This is like, you know, on the level of like Labyrinth and like Dark Crystal, like yeah, it's, it's this was icon. an epic. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But then I watched it the other night, rewatching. And I'm like, this is a fucking mess. <laughs> I don't know. I, I I don't enjoy like my my jaded adult eyes didn't enjoy it as much as I did as a child. Doesn't mean it's a bad film. There's a, I mean, it's just fun. There's a lot of enjoyment. It's just like madcap, and you're like from place to place to place, and it's like so frantic um and and it's just a ton of fun but it's just also this one didn't age as well to me as some of his other films Uh, this was this is what i wanted this was exactly what i wanted this was pete carpenter for me like i get it like i don't know i i I think i just I, i won a different kind of john carpenter and i didn't get him that much but he it feels like he made two different kinds of movies, you know. Sure. It, it was weird that like the exact same cast a year later made Prince of Darkness, which was a a real Carpentarian movie. Yeah. This wasn't this was he made a handful of movies that were just like Big Trouble in Little China that I just love because they were fun. Yeah, you I know? could see that. And, and you hit the like I erupted in applause when you said this was Mortal Kombat because I swear to God. This is Mortal Kombat. It's not just because like there's three. Well, this guys. is where Raiden and Shang Tsung came from. They yeah. were inspired directly from those characters. And Liu Kang, like your your mate, your Walter. Oh yeah, yeah, Kang, for sure. Uh, and Wang, from Wang Chi, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and uh, what's his face? Uh, Kurt Russell's character is Johnny Cage. I mean, this is uh, Johnny Cage was supposed to be uh, John Claude Van Damme. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. And actually, Johnny Cage was what Nicholas Cage was going to call himself. He wanted to call himself Johnny Blaze Nick. Uh, Luke Cage. Oh, God. <laughs> well, at least he got to be Johnny Blaze later on when he uh, took on Ghost yeah. Rider. Ooh, and a good thing he did. And the sequel. It's like, good for you, Nick. Make a sequel. God. Make, dude. make a worse movie somehow. What a Marvel movie. Oh, man. Um, yeah. What a Mar- DC. That was so bad. I swore DC made it. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Ghost uh, Rider 2. Come on. But, like, I like that he kept... Um, Dennis Dunn and Victor Wong for the next movie. Um, 
Speaking of well, wait, Sarah wait, Jessica you... Parker, Kim Cattrall was great in this. I don't Kim know. I just I hot in this. I, I like that he he took some of the same cast members and made a completely different movie a year later. But just I I liked this. I'm inclined to give this an A minus. Oh, I'm gonna give it a B minus. Uh, I don't I don't care what this movie looks like. It was what I wanted, and it's what I still want. Just like, the, this I, made me like movies like this. Okay. This made me seek out movies like Big Trouble in Little China. You know what? What's was, similar though, besides Mortal Kombat, Ghostbusters? Okay, okay, yeah, I, okay, I can see that. I, I, I think the iconic Indiana Jones, like it was kind of funny, kind of crazy looking. Yeah, the effects don't really hold up. That's what you don't like. The lightning looks like shit. All the weird mysticism it just it it was too carpentarian of an indiana jones for people to like it i think it was a yes. little bit too idiosyncratic it was like i saw that i like cronenberg this felt like a cronenberg meets steven spielberg yeah. steven spiel cronenberg with a little bit of uh lucas in there like good lucas in it's there. not a great movie but i fucking love it that's so, I mean, like totally fair it made it made me love movies so yeah it was an influence so of course i'm gonna rate it highly and of course i'm gonna love the movies that look like it and he didn't make too many movies like it i would say cronenberg made more movies like this than he he did but fuck it i gave it an a minus prince All of right. darkness mostly same cast one year later um wow what a shift. Probably, probably his most underrated film. I would. Yeah, I would agree. They, but th look, look at the theme here. They stripped his budget because he made he lost his he ass lost off. Yeah. Well, a million movie a million dollars. And so he's like, you know what? Fuck it. I don't need the studio screwing everything up. They made him reshoot an early scene. So he's like, well, we think Jack Burton seems like the sidekick in this movie. You got to do a scene in the beginning where it, it establishes him as the main character. And he's like, who gives a shit about that? Like, ah, people won't know who to root for. What okay, were they saying? That, that Walter they, was too you know, featured? Or what? Fair. He's like, fuck it. I will make a $3 million movie in one set. Hardly any practical effect. All the practical effects look like garbage, right? Like, in he poured. Trouble? No, no, in uh, Prince of Darkness. Oh, oh, oh. oh. It's like, I'm going to pour yeah. a bunch of green water on the floor and put. <laughs> ceiling lights on the floor and then show it upside down. Yeah. But that looked creepy. You know, it's like, uh, you're like, what could be simpler than recording dialogue backwards, David Lynch? But you do that and you're like, this sounds creepy as shit when they speak backwards. <laughs> so Prince of Darkness, $3 million budget. Perfect. You see a little bit of Satan's hand and coming out and like, I don't know. There's a lot of religious undertones in his movies, but it's always like, the religion was right. They always said that the Antichrist was going to come to Earth. And oh, by the way, religion wasn't really prepared to stop the Antichrist. They can't stop it. We're fucked. Yeah, that's what kind of scares people, because like all that religious crap that people buy into, like, oh, they love to scare themselves with that. But it's like, OK, yeah, the Antichrist is real and you can't do anything to stop him. That was so scary about the Prince of Darkness, because you had all these like 20 scientists and like, oh, we don't even know what's happening. And by the time we figured it out, it's too late to stop it. I, uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was creepy. You know, he likes to do, him doing like the electronic sounding voiceover, like in the dream, everybody had. How like, effective uh, was that? Like that was, they, they shot that on film and then they did. I, I forgot that I, I read how they did that but they distorted it and they shot it on film or whatever. And, uh, and, and, and like looped it back on VHS. I don't know e yeah. either way. They, they, they did it in a way where it just looked like someone was like videotaping it with their, like, you know, uh, yeah, with the, with the, the video camera my dad had in 1987. It, exactly. But how, but super, super effective. Um, very, cause it was, it was unsettling. This whole movie was unsettling. I love when, um, the the tall dark gentleman gets uh kind of taken over and he's just literally sitting in the mirror or standing just in front laughing, of the mirror. Yeah. Oh my but laughed crying like I was like my skin was crawling during this film. 
Uh, so effective. Yep. So like, uh, what he, what he likes to do is he likes to do exposition expositionary dialogue, and he's like, "I don't give a fuck. I'm playing the synthesizer." They're like, "Could you turn the synthesizer down a little so we can hear the dialogue?" He's like, "No, fuck you." Beep, 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 beep. Creepiest movie. It's super underrated. It's got a great soundtrack. Alice Cooper's in it. That's it's right. Scary people turn into bugs and Pizza the Hut. <laughs> that uh, Alice or uh, not Alice Cooper, but the guy that turned into bugs. That was the uh, effects supervisor. <laughs> in the movie he would he would uh go on he, he would come back in the next film uh they live for for a very small cameo but yeah he was the guy that got eaten by roaches was and, and that's what it was i mean it checked all the boxes right it, it makes you feel uncomfortable because you're dealing with religion you're dealing with insects you're dealing with just like slime and invasiveness like the 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 people that are possessed in this film are right up in your face and spitting in your mouth. Like, what is yeah. worse than that? Like, oh, I almost threw up when they um they held the dude down and she was spitting the stuff directly in his mouth and it made it sound like a a cup being filled up from a tap. Yes, oh, I was like, Ugh. <laughs> there's a, a literally an inside out person in this movie, and still that was like that was what got me. Yeah. Oh man. The the effect of like the the two se three second shot of our one of our protagonists at the end in the mirror, uh, kind of reaching back to kind of pull herself back into reality, and then Donald Pleasance kind of throws the 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 thing and breaks the mirror and all that stuff. Yeah, it was, it was such a fantastic shot. They they filmed that in a swimming pool. Uh, yeah, it, it's I think it took like three hours or something like that. But it was just like. Again, going back to Halloween and the thing type details, what made this film just a cut above everything else at the time. It, this film's weird because it's hard to place in his filmography, right? Because he has such high highs and such low lows. And even as, in his little trilogy, it's hard to be like, is this better than the thing? No, of course not. But is this better than In the Mouth of Madness? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, absolutely. And in the mouth of madness is fine. Right. But man, he made this for three million bucks and it scared the shit out of me. Yeah. Solid. And it's solid, got a solid B. Great soundtrack. Solid, solid B. B B plus. Okay. Like this a lot. I think it's I keep saying it's his most underrated movie, but I really believe that. Plus, is this the only movie acting Jameson Parker ever did? Which who was Jameson Parker? Who, uh, he was the, the dude with the mustache. He was on Simon and Simon oh. forever. He did a ton of TV. I just don't know. Yeah, he was fine. He did a lot of film acting. He seemed like a just you know '80s slash actor kind of guy. It's just weird. He's like, well, I have a PhD in microbiology. What about you? Oh, I'm one of this guy's physics students. I'm a college junior. Why are you here? Uh, probably to have an alien spit like weird green water in my mouth. Why are you here? <laughs> Oh, I'm probably going to break a wall with a table and get thrown out a window. <laughs> cool. See you later. Yeah. Uh, and then he made he made the uh, the follow up to Big Trouble in Little China that I always wanted. It's it's just I mean, this is just appropriate at this point for this uh, talking about this film. Uh, I was so turned off initially. See, this was the reverse. I thought they live was absolutely terrible the first time i saw it oh and you went back and liked it more i love this film now uh right it's did so you good. read it did you read the rain elson short story yes uh, yes uh, eight absolutely. o'clock in the morning yeah, yeah. If, i read that before i saw this okay yeah uh, like i was i was i was like a college freshman or something like that and i read that short story and Someone's like, oh, it inspired this movie. So I went and watched it. I was like, oh, I love this movie. Yeah. I I, I mean, I watched it. I mean, this, this is on out. this is on par with Big Trouble for me. This is what I want out of a Carpenter movie. I want to make in schlock. This is him hating on th this is a clear message of anti-capitalism and all that, where he was just like so disillusioned with not only the Hollywood and you know the entertainment industry, but just like life in general. <laughs> like he's like, fuck it, no one likes my films. I'm not appreciated in my time type thing. It, like he was, yeah. this was his self-aware movie, right? Yeah, but he's like, I don't want to take it too seriously either. I'll put a goddamn wrestler in it just so everyone knows. Okay. 
You know, you gotta get the butts and seats, though. I mean, Roddy Piper was hot back then. <laughs> yeah, I don't think he was put in this because he was a draw. I think he was put in this because he was just the perfect protagonist for this movie. Like this inspired Duke Nukem. Basically, Duke Nukem is is sure. yeah. Think about Roddy He's Piper though. Like, Piper. Think about how over the top he was and how restrained he is in this film. <laughs> like yeah, yeah. That's weird. <laughs> Keith David, man. Oh, what a gem. Just perfect in this film. Um, oh yeah. The, yeah. The, the fight scene. I mean that that's the that's the thing that everyone talks about. If you right? get if you get hot rod, you need to have him fight somebody, right? It was just great. This this is the kind of Carpenter movie I want. I'm not saying I don't want Halloween and you know in the mouth of madness, but I want Escape from New York. You know? Yeah. So I want Big Trouble in Little China. This was Big Trouble in Little China too. But Capitalism Boogaloo. And I ever? loved it. Yeah, in my opinion, a little better, maybe. I don't know. Uh, it was better executed, certainly. Uh, it wasn't as ambitious in in scope. But like this, yeah, you know, I said I hate his adaptations, but this was adapted from a short story. But he wrote the screenplay. He he fleshed it out a lot. Great soundtrack in this, or score in this one. Uh, th but this was like Carpenter. This was an interview with Carpenter, but in film form. You sit down with Carpenter and he's just going to hate. Every he's going to smoke cigarettes and blow it in your face and just be like, hey, you're an idiot and I'm an idiot. And the the human race is, is you know, meaningless and everything sucks and no one appreciates anything. That's this film. Um, but in the best way, but but in a fun way, too. Like and he just didn't give a this movie made its budget back the first weekend. Yeah. Like he just. Once he really just unfettered himself, he was like, I don't want anybody fucking with me. I'm going to make the movie I want to make. And when he did, this is what he made. And then he made a paycheck movie. Next. He mm. he made Starman too. They but, live giving cool. it an A minus. Yeah, uh, I'll I'll totally push you on that. A, a minus for sure. Um, what a piece of shit was memorized of an invisible movie. <laughs> It was a Chevy Chase film. And maybe it's because, yeah, and Chevy Chase is just a garbage person. <laughs> I, yeah. and he had a good cast for a comedy. Oh, man. Uh, right? Like comedy, Mike yeah. McKeon, Stephen Toblowski, a guy named Jim Norton who isn't the Jim Norton. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and Daryl Hannah. How hot was Daryl Hannah in this film, though? Uh, yeah. I mean, she doesn't do it for me, but she yeah. was pretty hot in this. She looks like uh, John Travolta in a wig now, so it's kind of hard to. <laughs> yeah, Kill Bill's man. Oof. With the one eye? I don't know. Yeah. Yikes. But yeah, she was. I don't know. She was, Yeah, she was. Th this was like. She was gorgeous back then. Um, acting wise, she was okay. Uh, yeah, but it was just. It was Chevy Sweet. Chase just be Stupid. doing a Chevy Chase bit the whole time. Yeah. And it was almost like a like um I'm clear Fletch. Yeah, who gives a yeah, shit? Yeah, ex exactly. It was just like <laughs> it was like a memoir for Chevy Chase, right? It's just like, yeah, everyone thinks Nick is funny, but he's kind of a douche too. And it's just like, what would happen if I was a fly on the wall? What would my friends say about me? Oh, uh, you're a douche. A and yeah. You lost $30 million. Oh, wait, that was John Carpenter. <laughs> he made a paycheck movie, but who got paid? He lost $30 million. But we got Sam Neill, and that didn't suck. Who he used later in a good movie that wasn't a C minus D plus. In the very next movie. Uh, yeah, I, we, we don't need to talk about this film anymore, right? I, I would say D, solid D. Sure. Yeah. Uh, next up, yeah, in the mouth of madness. Oh man, yeah, you like this more than the Prince of Darkness, which. Whew. Uh, I don't know, man. That's what I'm saying. It's just like it's hard because Sam Neill is such a a good creep, right? Like, and he's the protagonist in this. But this was like this came out when Sam Neill was just on top of his game with like Event Horizon. Uh, he just does just asshole so well he yeah he was he was kind of an asshole in this movie he was like yeah 
I caught you. You're scamming me. Everyone's a scammy scammer. Woo-hoo, I'm going to catch the scammers. <laughs> this was a big middle finger to Stephen King. Woo. I mean, kind of. Kind of. They, they even reference it. They're like, you could forget Stephen King. Uh, Sutter Kane is where it's at. He's writing these trashy novels and everyone loves it. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. As, as if Jurgen Prouch now is like even believable as <laughs> like an author. <laughs> right. Yeah. This, this film was great, man. Um, yeah, it was, it was good. Yeah. I liked it. It felt like a, it felt like a goosebumps book <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's like an R-rated R.L. Stein movie. Yeah, <laughs> right. Or like an Stephen R-rated King, R.L. Stein's outselling him. <laughs> yeah, and that's kind of what it was. I'm like, is this them? Like, is this Carpenter saying that R.L. Stein is a more prolific writer than Stephen King? Maybe. When he sat down in the theater at the end of the movie and he was watching In the Mouth of Madness and laughing, I was like, this is fucking stupid. <laughs> I hated that ending. I was so I was like, yeah. What a, uh, I don't know. That's coming to grips though. This, this is the this is MGMT, uh, you know, music video, but feature length. This is great. I love it. I don't know. This is. Uh, I like I like this movie uh, as much as that ending was sort of like. Yeah. This just kind of hit him referencing. He's like, I think I'm sane, but I'm acting like I'm crazy, and that's weird. How are things going on outside? <laughs> little expositiony for sure yeah yeah which um, was which was i was like why what's going on outside i didn't buy uh, charleston heston as a uh a magazine or a uh publisher at all i just wanted him Charl- to talk about his rifles i wasn't charlton heston it was yeah, oh it was. you're right it was yeah sure. yeah i thought he was gonna go on an nra speech but no from my cold dead hands you will pry this manuscript <laughs> yeah, it, I mean, I didn't, I didn't recognize him. That was Charlton Heston. You know, it's such a bizarre role, right? Like you think if you're casting someone like Charleston, Charleston Heston, he, he might have been like Sutter Kane, except they they cast that was one a, guy. Yeah, Jurgen Prouch now. <laughs> just, who's just weird, bad skin man. I don't know. He was in stuff. Yeah, I don't hey, know. He was the Ray Liotta's dermatologist. <laughs> Does That's my weird. face look like an orange peel yet? Yeah, man. Good. Thank you. You got it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It, even some of the effects. Now I'm kind of talking myself out of it because even some of the effects like the whole uh, uh, his his girlfriend or whatever that like crawls out. It literally was just like a contortionist with like a face on like someone's mask on and it looks yeah. just terrible. Yeah, that was. He... You initially you went in tonight thinking you like this more than you like Prince of Darkness, and I'm going to talk you into you like Prince of Darkness more than this. Uh, all right. I, I mean, I thought Sam Neill got like a letter grade just to himself, but yeah, I think I had to agree with you. I, I'd probably give this B minus, C plus, C plus. I'll say C plus. Ah, I can't. It was fine. I like a B minus. B minus yeah. seems fair. Okay. B, B, B minus rather than B minus C plus. We could agree on that. Um, next up, Village of the Damned. Christopher Reeves, <clears throat> last roll before the accident. What a way to go out. <laughs> what a piece of shit. No, I like this film. This He shits on Stephen King and then makes a goddamn Stephen King movie. Absolutely. Yeah, the kids I are mean, it was okay. based on a John Wyndham book, but like... I don't know, man. Oh, man. This this sucked. I thought this was his last, like, decent film. I I think it's underrated. his last decent film. (laughs) Yeah. But that says more about three movies we barely need to talk about than it does about this. This just sucked. You know? Really? Mark Hamill as a priest. So miscast. Was Mark Hamill ever good in anything other than Star Wars and Batman? Bet now, well, regular show. You're a dad, you know, regular show. She's two. Okay, you don't know, regular. <laughs> yeah, he's a good voice. I actor. Some, I, yeah, he's a, he's a great voice actor, but like, I don't know, he wasn't yeah. he wasn't good in this because this wasn't good. This just sucked. 
Uh, uh, this was Children of the Corn. This was Children of the Corn meets The Fog to me. Like, I, I was watching this, and I'm like... Oh, so it's a bad movie meets another bad movie? No, and, and I get that, but I'm just like, it's not... I, oh, this is hard mm, for me. You I, can't you can't defend this movie. It's indefensible, <laughs> but you're trying, and I don't know why. Just, Hold why on. don't we just move on? No, 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 it's okay, though. Like, because it, it was just like... <sighs> All right, no, it was kind of bad. No, 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 but it was, I don't know. Like, the premise was original. Um, some of the effects were cool. I liked how it was, it was, oh, it was, you know what it was? It was Final Destination if it was, like, children, like, setting the things. If Final Destination had a plot, that's what this would be. It's, like, all these, you know, occurrences are happening in this town. So, you know, uh, I don't know. Yeah. It, it was it was not as bad as ever, everyone shit on this film, and that's why I think I was like, okay, so I already knew it was going to be terrible. So I watched it, and I'm like, okay, it's, oh, it's it wasn't really terrible. It was merely shitty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> fair. <laughs> that's I mean, it, I like. Did you not like this better than? I mean, the that's Fox? like saying, wasn't this kidney stone smaller and less pointy than the first one? Well, was it? <laughs> sure. Okay, I'll give this a D plus instead of a solid D. Aww, like it. I'm C plus in this thing. I am C plus C minus. In... C minus is the highest that will go. Okay, was this at least better than the next film? Because the next film was just awful. I like this piece of shit. All right, die on. This I film. should have been mad at this movie for like making me like Escape from L.A. or Escape from New York less. Like this existing makes escape from new york worse yep like a bad sequel will make a movie worse mm -hmm. and i'm still not that mad at it because this didn't take itself seriously at all this, this was this is a piece of shit it's the worst made carpenter film worst oh made. no yes technically speaking absolutely it's no nah, man awful <laughs> i like this a lot more than you did Buscemi's fine, and Bruce Campbell's great. The rest of it, Pam Greer, Peter Fonda, come on, mm. Stacy, goddamn Keach. No, this movie was. It wasn't quite a sequel to Escape from New York because it totally it was different. Yeah, it was just totally goofy. Was same fucking movie. I, I liked. I liked a goofy movie. I. I, I fine. He's fine. He makes good movies when he's serious, but I just wanted to. This is a piece of shit, but I liked it. I will give this a C, B minus C plus. God, there's nothing. I don't know. It's just stupid. It, everything. It's, it's, it's totally consistent with Escape from New York. And then at the same time, it totally isn't. If, if they would have done something like the whole plastic surgery gang, but did that more and did like more factions, I think it would have worked a little bit more. So but, you wanted the warriors. Yes. Fine, yeah, I did. And I mean, this wasn't that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this sucked. Vampires sucked. Ghost of Mars sucked. <laughs> and that's our review of John Carpenter. Like his idiosyncrasies rather than just like reviewing all of his movies because he made some bad fucking movies, man. He made Ghost of Mars. Oh, man, it, it really, like the wheels fell off the train, but it, it, go, it coincides so perfectly with him, right? Like, his disillusion and his need to keep playing golf and Fortnite and 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 buy smokes like that's what Carpenter's film kind of or uh, Carpenter's career kind of became. Uh, it just I subjected myself to vampires Ugh. again because I'm a professional and I wanted to be prepared for this podcast. Do you understand? I watched vampires even though I've seen it before, and I was like, okay, I get it. He doesn't know what he's doing anymore. I watched that piece of shit twice. James Woods. He's like, Hey, you know what a unsufferable douchebag you are in real life. And James was like, ah, yeah, I think it. he's like, just do that. Just be that guy. <laughs> just slap a prostitute in the face. Oh, how un we spoke a little bit about this off the air and how on, you know, not with the time they could not make this movie now. They um, got Daniel Baldwin. He's the third mm. worst Baldwin. <laughs> you remember how when Alex Baldwin was the shit and then everyone thought he was terrible and then he wound up being the best out of I that I never bunch? thought he was terrible. 
he had a little bit of anyone, a anyone who got upset at him for calling his daughter a little pig or whatever has never had a kid. <laughs> Fair. Fair. Adam Baldwin is the worst Baldwin. We can all agree on that. He's not related, <laughs> but his name's Baldwin. Fuck that guy. Oh God. He's still, you could still see him in like CSI's and then stuff. Then like Steven and then, and then uh, Daniel. Daniel's the third worst Baldwin. What about William? You forgot Billy. No, he's, he's better than Daniel. He's dead. He might be gone by now. I don't know. Uh, so vampires, piece of shit. Vampires is the okay. So if anyone watches this show or listens to this podcast, I am not a fan of raising Arizona uh, from the Coen brothers. <laughs> and I, like I stated on that show, that was the closest I came to turning off a film that I was going to review for this show. This I absolutely turned off. I could not stand another minute of it. It's just the worst. It is if there was a below F grade for this, it's it deserves it because I hate James Woods and this is James Woods, but like turned up to fifty. It, it just makes your skin crawl. It was not in a good adapted way. Adapted from a novel called Vampires, and the S is a dollar sign. Oh God! Doesn't isn't it make you physically cringe? Because. <laughs> Vampire movies are a little too. Okay, so when the economy's shitty, and like the economy is always going to be shitty for people my age, right? Right. It's like, well, you have a hundred thousand dollars in student debt, and your parents stole your social security, so go fuck yourself. We'll let you work an unpaid internship if you want. Um. We like zombie movies because we're like, oh, what if I didn't have the student debt? What if just everything went back? to like zero there was no money and then i got to wait for the my student loan officer to turn into a zombie before i shoot him in his forehead you know <laughs> wouldn't i love that when the economy's good everybody wants to be a vampire is like holy shit i can afford cocaine and an apartment and i'm gonna <laughs> live forever i want to yeah. be 25 forever it's like rich yuppie douchebags wanting to be young and be beautiful for the rest of their lives so vampire movies vampires in late, the late 90s when like the economy was already starting to go to shit like didn't even make any sense yeah so, like you, you don't want vampire movies when the economy sucks and that's why twilight was so off-putting <laughs> it was for teenagers like i want to be 14 forever i want somebody saying something mean about me on facebook to be the biggest problem i ever face so, <laughs> but, th but that's even more current and, and uh, self-aware of the time that, and, and the demographic it was made for, this was just the most mean spirited. Like, like I said, you watch Carpenter films and he's known for his restraint. He doesn't show like a lot of nudity. He's just, he is very much like a atmospheric, you know, tonal filmmaker this was just throwing all of that out it was just like here's all everything it, it was like someone it was the equivalent to someone doing this like someone putting their hand in your face for 90 minutes and saying you can't get mad and i just hated uh, every second yeah, of it yeah this was a miserable experience miserable miserable I give, on a scale from a to f i give this a v i give this a <laughs> dollar an s that's a dollar sign <laughs> S minus dollar sign. Uh, Ghost of Mars is next. Uh, it, not as bad, but pretty, pretty dumb. Pretty stupid. It made me not like Natasha Henstridge. Yeah. I mean, she didn't do much. She did this in Species, and that was it. Uh, Ice Cube. She was in the whole nine yards, man. Oh, yeah. Fine. It's made me not even like Ice Cube. Ice Cube is is like cinema gold, in my opinion. I love seeing Ice Cube. And no, quick, name something good that Ice Cube was in that he didn't write it himself. Go. I don't care. Friday. Friday's great. He wrote Friday. Okay, so Friday, and that's it. <laughs> this was bad. Don't don't see. Ghost Triple X State of the Union, man. Come on. God, it was. If you like professional wrestling, you might like this film. If you don't, then don't watch it. Yeah, this is like if a professional wrestling fan was a person. It's this movie. <laughs> it's like Vince McMahon directed it. Uh, 
it, it was bad. Uh, yeah, Jason Statham's not, can't even save this. It's not like he's even good. What That's has what Jason Statham ever saved? <laughs> he's been the worst part of every good movie he's been in. That's true. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah. When when Jason Statham's your your saving grace, you're doing something wrong. Uh, and then we'll we'll end this on the yeah. So so probably D minus F plus. Yeah. Um, sure. Sure. Who cares? The ward. You know what? I'm going to admit, I didn't even see the ward. I forgot he made it. And then I was prepping for this movie and I didn't even watch it. That's how little of a fuck I gave <laughs> just based on just the way things were going. Yeah. He's Kevin Smith thing it up hard. This is anything. It's going to be his red state. Oh, stop his, it. Red state is cop out. Oh, red you would like red state. Oh, <laughs> red state is fine. Oh, come on. Um, no, the ward is his tusk for sure. Um, oh, Jesus. Yeah, which is not saying much. It, the ward's better than the previous two films. Tusk, I left the theater angry. Okay, so yeah, that's because I, Tusk but, is a joke, but the joke was on you as the audience. Like when the end credits are playing, and he's like, it's the clip from Smodcast where he's like, oh, yeah, what if you turned into a, uh, a walrus? And you're like, walrus is. Oh, I. <laughs> Man is is man really a walrus and or something like that? Whatever dumb pot premise he came up with. He thought yeah. of something funny when he was high, and then he crowdfunded. He made us pay yep. for a movie that was a joke, and then I paid move money to see it. And he's like, ah, jokes on you. This movie was a joke. It wasn't a serious thing. It was just uh, what if I I got dared to make this movie? Ugh. Ah. Uh, yeah the ward was bad the ward was just basically a studio uh we're, we're just like okay what can we do to switch it up a little bit what you know we're just gonna make a piece of crap so we you know what's gonna make our crap smell a little bit better than the rest oh let's put john let's dig up john carpenter from the senior home and put him in the, the just, director's yeah. chair and like the guys who wrote this, Michael and what's his name, Rasmussen, didn't even write anything good. No. It was so twisty and turny and just... They did Dark Feet and The Inhabitants. Ugh, it was the worst. It, it, it was really bad. Uh, talk about jump scares galore. It, everything is a jump scare. They can't flush a toilet. It was, like a, making... it was like a parody. Yeah. Of John Carpenter. Like, making him direct it is... I don't know, man. Yeah, it's it's sad. This was like it's, it's like making somebody direct a cuckold porno with his wife. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, pretty much. Uh, Amber heard like, hey, we're gang banging your reputation. You want to film it? Here's here's five bucks. Yeah, 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 totally. Uh, Amber Heard's the worst actress on the I, I, this. Yeah, I know they're like Amber Heard is the hottest woman on the planet because of her facial symmetry. I'm like she's leveraging none of that hotness in this joyless slog. No, it, it's terrible. It's uh, yeah, she's even worse than like Kristen Stewart at this point. Uh, watching this, she film. looks like a less hot Alicia Silverstone to me. But I, if people think she's Lindsay Fonseca is in this movie, and. Lindsay Fonseca is actually the hottest woman on the planet. I don't know what everyone's talking about. Everyone looked like uh, Seventeen magazine, but they're all in an insane asylum, and it's just, yeah. Right? <laughs> I'm just like, what? Like everyone's got perfect makeup on. Like Amber Heard's hair is just done up right, like in every single scene, even though she's getting it, the crap beat out of her. You know, every few seconds, it's just stupid. Can we just spend the rest of the talking about Lindsay Fonseca and how perfect she is? Who does she play in the ward? I can't picture her. I didn't see it, but she was in Kick Ass and she was the How I Met Your Mother. Oh, sure. Daughter. Yeah. yeah. She's on Nikita, which like is surprisingly a good show. Yeah. 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 She's, I mean, she sucks in this film because this film sucks. Um, but it's better than Ghost of Mars and Vampire. So don't, don't see it. So what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Um, D thing like this is an authentic kind of discussion about his career and it just starts off at kind of the, the highest of highs. Like, I mean, you think about some yeah, of the he greatest got, He films. definitely, he got, he got worse. He got worse. He, well, it was like a, he kind of peaked in the middle, right? He's sort of like, he was good through the eighties and then 
he was real bad at the end, but like he was still making good movies in the nineties. In the mouth of madness was great. That was 94, 95. But then oh. after that, he was just sort of like, I don't know. And it, he could make more pieces of shit. He just doesn't want to. So good yeah. for him. Yeah. Uh, I think something he does better than any other director is he makes his own music. Yes. And he does a really good job of tonally establishing tension. Yep. His father was a professor of music, so he knows exactly what he's doing, how to use music for effect. He does it better than anybody else. And he doesn't use a lot of popular songs. He just composes stuff. I like that about him. Um, he uses a lot of religious imagery, which is, you know, like a, a lot of his stuff is like, well, here's religion and as a metaphor, but religion actually was right about the monsters and stuff like that, but it actually isn't prepared to save us. So it's, I wonder what his take on religion is. It's sort of like, well, he loves the imagery, but at the same time, he's sort of like, well, the clergy has failed you. All they want to do is diddle kids. They can't stop the Antichrist. It's sort of sure. like, wow, that's bleak. His beliefs are so ambiguous. I mean, even with his political yeah. views, because like he made They Live, which is the most anti-capitalist thing, but he's like, I'll go have a drink with James Woods. It's like, wait, what? Like, that doesn't make any sense. Well, if you need a uh, just the biggest dick, just James Woods just seems like the biggest dick. Sure. So like, that was perfect for that. I don't know, man. It's perfect for that horrible movie. Yeah, vampires are real, and we have 10 vampire hunters total, and then a vampire killed nine of them, and you're like, oh, shit, what about all our <laughs> vampire hunters? That was it. That was the fucking... Uh. Oh, God. So, uh, I mean, we, we, we've kind of letter-graded everything. Can we just kind of agree that vampires is the worst? I mean, I liked it when I was 13. Ugh. It just seemed like... It seemed like a direct-to-DVD sequel to, uh, <laughs> you know, yeah, to like a, to like a horror movie. It, it was like from it, Dust Till Dawn three with James oh, Woods. God, and who wants to see that? Uh, I saw from Dust Till Dawn two. It was terrible, except the opening scene because Bruce Campbell was fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> and, in like the first five seconds, uh, yeah, but that's. That's it. Uh, I mean, yeah, John Carpenter is man. What a what a ride! This, like we said last time with uh, with Refn. Well, okay, I'll say that with the Carpenter films, I wish I would have watched them in reverse order because I felt like I left this review on a sour note. Yeah, you just watch a bunch of bad shit at the end. Yeah, yeah. and it, it sucks because like Refn's just like. When we talked about references, it's like all the films were were at least visually appealing and, and entertaining, but he was just a, a complete shithead. But Carpenter is a shithead, but in a in a cool like old man curmudgeon way. And it, like I said before, if anyone deserves to be disillusioned with the business and with Hollywood, it is him because he's made some masterpieces and no one appreciated it while it was happening. Yeah, it kind of took people a while, but he's got a lot of cult favorites. Like, he just makes... He's like, oh, what would I want to see? And there's just... Uh, I like his cult movies. Halloween's <laughs> not a cult movie. Halloween's just a good movie, but like... But think Trouble about Little China's a cult movie. They Live's a cult movie. I like that kind of stuff. But so. think about this. Like, say we say we, we upload this, right? And everyone... no one No one cares. And then we're like... 75 years old and ever and then it becomes like a phenomenon and they're like john and jason were just fantastic by the time we're 70 years old who cares you don't care you care when you're doing it when you're making it so i mean that sucks <laughs> what a life right he's he's got money yeah we're not getting paid for this that's true so you still do better than we are yeah but yeah. i'm also not hand painting leaves that's true for this podcast. So maybe we should put more work in. Who knows? Yeah, I'll start hand painting something. All right. Well, that that's our our John Carpenter director's cut. This was uh, this was a blast, sir. Where can everyone find you? I'm on Twitter at Jason E. Alt. Um, 
do all kind of magic together related projects. I'm on a podcast called Brainstorm Brewery. I write for a couple of websites. Hey, here's an idea. Type my name into Google. Uh, maybe I'll have a website someday where I can find out all the stuff I'm up to. But yeah, just Google me. I'm very Googleable. Very Googleable. Hashtag Googleable. Um, I'm hella go- Sometimes I'll log in incognito mode just so I will get a, a blank Google and just look at how Googleable I am. Yeah, that's the reason. Sure. I'm Googleable as hell. <laughs> you, while Jason's going and Googling himself, you could find me uh, on this very channel. They said we said you could also find me on Twitter and the Reddits uh, at Orzov Dunn uh, and all the other things that like John Denning. That's my name. So until next time, for Jason, I'm John. We'll see you at the movies. <laughs>